Well, over the, <clears throat> the years, particularly this past decade that we've been together, I've often uh, shared with you <clears throat> some stories and events about my childhood adoption by the parents of my natural birth mother and thus being adopted by my, my grandparents. <clears throat> so I grew up knowing all about the history of that half of my background, dating back to the Protestant Reformation in Switzerland. But the paternal side remained much in mystery. And with the resource, uh, research resources that we have nowadays with tools like Ancestry.com, <clears throat> I've been able to trace back a few generations and made some very interesting discoveries. But I've been blocked <clears throat> about three generations back uh, from getting any further by some things that don't seem to, to make sense. A great-grandfather, I can't get past him, who appeared to essentially be an orphan child growing up in a household with the, the names of people who don't seem to be relatives at all in the 1850s, 1860s. And so I've been kind of stuck there until I had an interesting breakthrough a couple weeks ago when I, I came across an article about his untimely death in an industrial accident. And it listed two surviving sisters that I never knew about. I didn't know he had any sisters or siblings. And a little research with them quickly revealed the common, uh, that these, uh, uh, the, the common mother of these three siblings <clears throat> had died when they were all very, very little, with my actual biological great-grandfather being still less than a year old. So it would appear that the father apparently farmed them out to some folks and then went west by himself, as best I'm able to understand. So the last name of this whole family system is Parks. Parks. But here's the, the interesting part of this recent story, is that in these new-to-me records of the sisters, it gave the maiden name of the mother of the three siblings, so my great-great-grandfather's maiden name. And her last name is Rockefeller, from a north-central New Jersey clan by that name. Well, I looked at that, and I started, and it didn't even take hardly any time at all to trace them back, generations after generation, in New Jersey, and um, checking out that lineage that went back even to several generations in Rhineland, Germany. The original ancestor came here in 1723, and the answer is yes. He is a common ancestor. Uh, a com have a common ancestor with the famous Rockefellers of New York, Nelson and William Avery. So here I put it on a chart, this lineage, dating back several generations even to Europe. So my sixth great-grandfather is Nelson Rockefeller's second great-grandfather. So I can rightly say, I can say, I know it now, that I am something about 6% Rockefeller. And so, uh, that is a lot higher percentage Rockefeller than, like, for example, uh, uh, what's her name? Elizabeth Warren is Native American. All right, just saying. <laughs> but this information I shared with you, along with a $10 bill, will get you a small cappuccino at Starbucks, so I'm told. Not that I would ever do such a thing or go to such a place. But anyhow, just see me now. I'm Randy Rockefeller Parks Buckman. That's who I am. So you can go just call me Rocky for short. <clears throat> now, yo, all right. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. So, but does not all of this like completely and entirely, this information you just got, it completely and entirely changes the way you see me now, doesn't it? I mean, really, you have to see me in an entirely new light, right? Oh, you don't. But, but what about the name? What about the name Rockefeller? That changes everything, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Well, we might ask the question, what's in a name? What's in a name? Shakespeare asked that very question in Romeo and Juliet. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, is the famous quote. 
And in this Christmas season, and over the next two Sundays into Christmas Eve, I'm asking that question about Jesus. What's in a name? We're calling this series Name Tag. What's in a name? Well, <clears throat> maybe a rose doesn't, the name word rose doesn't tell us much about floral fragrance and uh, thiols that constitute the chemistry of smell, but the name of Jesus Christ tells us a lot about exactly who he is. We know from the scriptures that his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These titles, these names, of course, come from the famous passage in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What I want to do is to break down this prophecy into four parts. You see that in your insert. Wonderful Counselor today, Mighty God next week, in two weeks, Everlasting Father, then Prince of Peace on Christmas Eve. So today, as we talk about Jesus as the Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful Counselor, what does that mean? And as always, what I'd like to do in biblical studies is go back to original source words that are in the biblical text and see how they were used in the time and exactly what their definition and their meaning was at the time of the writing of the scriptures by the original authors. So, wonderful, the word wonderful here. That's from a Hebrew word that means something that is so extraordinary that it's, it, it's difficult to even understand. So this would mean something that's just mind-blowing, beyond imagination is the idea of this word. Maybe even more amazing than Lamar Jackson of the Ravens carrying a football. I mean, just mind-blowing. Counselor, from another Hebrew word that means to give advice based upon deeply thoughtful, deliberate, and, and, and just sort of a whole, the whole plan, understanding the whole plan of something with purpose. So it's more than just kind of a knee-jerk, well, let's think about this for a minute kind of thing. No, it's advisement based upon a deep awareness of the big picture of everything and all its details. That's what it means, the word counselor. So if you put wonderful counselor together, it's an amazingly deep understanding of everything. This depth of understanding that dazzles you with the big picture of what everything is about and how to practically live with wisdom in light of that knowledge. That's who Jesus is. Wonderfully counseling, able to do all of this. So let me ask you, is that how you see Jesus? As the one who gives wisdom for living that is beyond any resource imaginable. And I assure you that Jesus is able to live up to his name a lot better than the local Rockefeller. All right. But let's take this first word and ask uh, the idea of Jesus and the wonder of Jesus. And how is it that he's wonderful, amazing, just, just beyond belief? We live in a world of amazing gadgets, devices, and machines, and, and we have much to wonder at. I'm amazed over the brief the course of the several decades of my life of all the advances that have been made and technology and things of that sort, coming from a generation where my generation, when we were kids, we had a sense of wonder and awe and amazement as we watched people flying into space and rocket ships and then walking around on the moon. But I could have never imagined back then, never imagined having a video conversation on a phone that I carried around in my pocket with a missionary friend <coughs> excuse me, who's serving on the other side of the world. And all these, <coughs> excuse me, wonders have perhaps made us not so significantly, not nearly as significantly, have wonder at the person of Jesus Christ, who it is and what he has done. So what are some of the wonderful elements about Jesus? Let me list for you quickly six things. The first is his amazing birth narrative. Amazing birth narrative. To be the savior of the world, there's only one way Jesus could have been born. He had to be 100% God and 100% man. And the only way this could happen is by the way he was born as a virgin birth. We call this the hypostatic union. The two hypostases is the Greek word coming together, two natures coming together, 100% of each. So he's a fully man, yet he does not 
because of the virgin birth, inherit through Adam the curse of sin. But he's still 100% man. But he's 100% God. To be perfect, the only way that he could then be the, the correct sacrifice to pay for the sin, being the same substance of what he was paying for, not like the lambs and goats and things of that sort, but the same substance, the same apostasy, the same nature as what we are. And so the narrative is an amazing story. The uniqueness of his birth was recognized by the Magi, pointing toward Christ's role as a king. His birth was feared by Herod, pointing toward the rejection that he would experience by the peoples and powers of this world. He was excitedly welcomed by the shepherds, pointing toward Christ's salvation for the common person. As in Luke 2, we see about the shepherds, all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So there was wonder, yes, at the birth of the king of Israel. But here's a second wonder about Jesus, his precise fulfillment of ancient prophecies. I mean, think about it. There are different ways in which we might count all the prophetic and messianic statements of the Old Testament. Jewish scholars list about 450 passages that have an anticipation looking toward the Messiah. And there are certainly almost 200 very specific prophecies that were very clearly, clearly undeniably fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Things like being born of a virgin in Bethlehem, um, that he would come from Nazareth of Galilee, that he would have a sojourn in Egypt, and that he would be of the family and lineage of David, and that he would be rejected and so forth. There's just simply no way that all of these things could have just somehow happened without a divine plan. And that is indeed a great, <clears throat> a great wonder. Here's a third thing. It's perfect sinless life. It is flawless, as it needed to be, in order for him to qualify as the perfect, eternal Savior. No person has ever uh, been hit with the same level of intensity and temptation as Jesus Christ was in those dealings with the devil over a 40-day period. And even while knowing that the cross was facing him, and at the end of his earthly mission, he withstood everything that Satan threw at him. Unlike the first Adam... Adam means first man, is what the word means. He was the perfect man who perfectly obeyed God. A fourth thing we can see is his divinely authoritative teachings. Jesus was known as a wise teacher and a miracle worker. His teaching was astonishing because it says in the scriptures that he taught with authority, which is apparently quite different from the other teachers of his day. There were at least 34 miracles that Jesus performed, recorded in the Gospels. Jesus healed physical, emotional, and spiritual sicknesses, having as well the authority to forgive sins. And the ultimate deed was raised, the raising of Lazarus, of course, from the dead, the statement of his authority over death as well. But here's a fifth thing we might wonder at about how Jesus is wonderful. Again, his death on the cross. When has there ever been an innocent person who so willingly allowed the execution of his own life? He could have stopped it all, but in obedience to God's master plan of salvation, he submitted to it and bore the sins of the world as a sacrificial lamb. It's in <clears throat> Romans 5 that it says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Don't for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ goes to the cross, and you know what the cross was? It was the equivalent of a hangman's noose or an electric chair. Yet he turned that contemporary mode of execution of that time into the greatest symbol of God's love that humankind has ever known. Everything he touched, he made it wonderful. Here's a sixth thing. Of course, his resurrection and ascension. The greatest miracle of all time and eternity, that Christ comes forth, the author of a new creation, never to die again, offering eternal life to those who believe in him. Not just a, a spiritual resurrection in some mystical way, 
but a bodily, physical resurrection. And then he goes for 40 days later to his father in an ascension from he to heaven, a human being entering heaven and then seated at the throne of God. You know, you put all this together, it is no wonder, uh, no wonder that the annals of time itself are rightly demarcated as before Christ and A.D. in the year of our Lord. And think about it. This wonderful, amazing person died for you. He loves you. He calls you to himself to have a living and a daily vibrant relationship with him. This is wonderful. Beyond all belief and imagination, and yet we know it is true. But then the second of our words, wonderful counselor, counselor. Uh, how is Jesus a wonderful counselor? Again, the meaning of that Hebrew word speaks of an advisement based upon a deeply thoughtful, deliberate, and purposeful plan, one that's cognizant of the whole bigger picture. Indeed, whenever we go to get advice on something, we want to be with someone who deeply, completely, fully understands the information and, and the big picture of all that we're, we're, we're seeking help with. If we go to a physician, we want to know that it's someone who understands the whole picture and the deep nature of our ailment. We go to an investment advisor. We want someone who sees a big picture of our specific situation and what is the right thing for us to be involved with versus some sort of just generic thing that's sold to anybody. A building contractor. You want someone who's both a specialist in terms of specific areas and needs, but also is a person who understands the order of construction and who will not forget to finish like the plumbing before the drywall is completed, something like that. <coughs> Excuse me, an insurance broker. You, you, this needs to be a person who can put together a package that is best for you, not just the simple off-the-shelf plan that they just kind of generically sell to everyone. And so relative to the big issues of life, our need is for a counselor who is, a, who is daily aware of our challenges, who knows the big plan of it all and has a big picture view of things better than we ever could, along with the desire to walk with us for our best good. And that is what we have in Jesus Christ. In fact, what we have through Jesus is kind of the platinum plan of access to God himself, the creator of the universe. <coughs> Excuse me. mountains of the countryside of northwest New Jersey. I've told you this story too before. It's, it's immediately next to an exclusive country club. Our home was on the opposite bank of the first hole. It was not unusual for me to find a golf ball in the yard and a right-handed person teeing off in the first hole might hook it right into my yard and, and then it was my golf ball. And being an entrepreneurial kid, what I did is I collected these balls as well as many hundreds of others that I found around the edges of the course. And then I would sell them back to the dopey golfers who lost them. I'd wash them up. I'd display them in egg cartons on a bench on the 18th tee. But this business that I had had many hazards. You know, of my, I'm infamous for my fear of snakes. Okay, this is what it goes back to. And the golf club was private again, very exclusive. I was not allowed on it whatsoever. My business was a very underground, surreptitious operation. And most of my golf ball hunting was done in fields and forests just over the property line. And, but there were times at certain points where I'd have to rush across a portion of the course to get over to the next region, the next area of the business. And I always watched to make sure that I was not seen by the grounds crew who would chase me on Jeeps and things like that to get me off the private country club. Well, in my school, I had one classmate friend whose family 
had a membership at the club. And one day he invited me to be his guest, and I was thrilled. When I was with him, a member, a guy who was a member there, known to everyone, at the pool, at the clubhouse, at the pro shop, I was able to boldly walk around places that I would have never been able to go by myself. Many of the most important people we know in the world, of course, do not have open access through their door to go and meet them and just walk up and meet them. What happens to people who jump the fence at the White House and run toward the door? Do they get tackled or at least exposed to it? And when I was in Italy a few years ago, we went to the Vatican, and there were no signs, arrows, or doors that said, this way to the Pope, come on in. A couple of decades ago when I was in England and at the gate of Buckingham Palace, there were these really big dudes there with poofy hats and red suits, and they looked like they'd kill you if you went past them, which they would. So you can't just walk up to the Pope, the Queen of England, or the POTUS and act like you own them. No, you, you'll get taken down in a hurry if you try. So surely God, who is actually greater than these illustrations, and he really is, surely he is even more unapproachable. But here's the amazing truth. That's not the way it is. The, the scriptures actually say that we can boldly come into God's very presence in the time of need to receive help. We're welcome. We're invited. We're encouraged to come before him. And that's just absolutely amazing stuff. It says this in Hebrews in chapter 4. It says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Wow, it's not scary, doesn't it? And it is very sobering. There is no hiding the mess that each of us are. God sees our every fault. It's open in the sunlight, like in the middle of a vast prairie. <coughs> There's no hiding anything. But here's the great news. Read on. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess, profess, because we do not have a high priest who is a, unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. This is an amazing counseling resource that we possess as believers in Christ. It says he is the great high priest who is in the very presence of God. I remind you what a priest does. A priest represents the people before God. A prophet represents God to the people. But he is not just any priest. He's the great high priest, not just in a temple of this world, but in heaven itself. And he represents us there Jesus was fully man like us, yet without sin, therefore perfect. He represents us by having not just been the high priest, but have been the perfect sacrifice as well, being the same stuff as we are, paying the debt of sin, and we have, because of all of this, bold encouragement to come openly before God with our needs for his counsel, including with our sins and our weaknesses that need forgiveness and his strength to overcome. We are with Christ when we go before God. He's like the member. He's like the family person. <coughs> and we don't fear being harmed or driven away. I just don't know how to help anyone who cannot see how incredibly awesome this privilege is. So let's use it. It's wonderful indeed that we have such a wonderful counselor in times such as we live. I mean, these really are some crazy days in which we live and move in a culture that is increasingly hostile to truth and righteousness. So many things appear upside down, yet even so, 
such times as these have not been rare throughout all of history. Our primary text back there in Isaiah 9 was given to the nation of Israel in very perilous times. Unbelief was rampant. The kings in the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes distinguished from the two southern tribes, the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin, these northern tribes were disinterested in the message of Isaiah. During Isaiah's lifetime, exactly in the year 722 B.C., the northern kingdom was taken captive by the Assyrian Empire, and those people were melded into the culture of the time. And Isaiah prophesied of a future time when a Messiah would come with authority and justice. And a part of this definition is that by name he would be the wonderful counselor, as we have said, possessing an amazing ability to advise and guide those who seek him, those who come before him, him, the one who has the big picture over it all. So we are welcome to boldly seek and use his counsel. Again, what a resource this is for us all. It would be very crazy for us to be flippant about this, like the Israelites of Isaiah's time, to not value this practical treasure and resource and to consciously take it, take it with us throughout every aspect of our lives, moment to moment, day to day, and year to year. Let's do that. Father, make us those kinds of people who understand how lost we are without you, yet to be filled with amazement and wonder at your love for us that brings us to you, close to you, to your presence as a resource through our faith and trust in Christ. Father, may we be encouraged in this Christmas season to avail ourselves more of this wonderful resource that we possess. In Jesus' name, amen.